Welcome to Talk NYC's 2023 Spring Showcase, our mid-year celebration of documentary films and series. I am Ruth Somalo, Senior Features Programmer at Doc NYC, and we will be bringing you some insight into the frontline documentary, American Reckoning. We have the pleasure and the honor today to be speaking with director and producers, Yoruba Richin and Brad Lichtenstein. And we also have two very special guests. We have Denise Jackson Ford, which is a participant and the daughter of Warless Jackson Sr. And we also have Cynthia, De oh, sorry, Cynthia Didel, former chief of the FBI Civil Rights Unit. Thank you and hello everyone, welcome. Hi, thank you. Oh. So good to have you. Uh, this is such an important film. And I would like to maybe start um, you both, Yoruba and Brad, to tell us a little bit more about the genesis of the project. I know for you, Brad, it's, like a, it's, it's been like a long time in your life since you are also um, had a, a deep connection with Representative uh, John Lewis. But maybe you can tell us both, like when did this project start for you? And at what point in the, um, in the research and in the in the um, cases uh, you came in and about the wider context also of the frontline um, unresolved series. First of all, thank you for having us. We really appreciate Doc NYC hosting this. And uh, the genesis of the project for me was, it's true, I had known Congressman Lewis since I was 15 years old and had worked in his campaign when I was a kid and we had stayed in touch and the project really came about learning from him and his press secretary, um, Brenda, that there were these cold cases and that they had introduced the Emmett Till Act as a way to try to bring more attention and money towards uh, solving these civil rights era cases. So that was way back in about 2014. Um, I learned shortly afterwards that there were about 12, 13 journalists who were working on various cases, um, including Stanley Nelson, who was nominated for a Pulitzer and is the reporter uh, down in Louisiana whom we worked with. So that sort of got me started in terms of learning more and more about these stories. And eventually um, I was pointed towards the Warless Jackson story um, by some of those journalists. And I met Warless Jr., um, Warless Jackson Sr.'s son, and Denise, uh, not too long after um, I had heard about the, the story and went down to Natchez, Mississippi, uh, where we all met and talked about making a film. And um, I think what I'll do is pass it to Yoruba for how she came in, and then I'm happy to sum up the overall frontline um, projects that are part of it, that we're part of. Um, so I uh, met Brad when I was making my second film. Uh, the New Black, and we were both at ITVS, um, the, you know, the funding organization, and we bonded uh, and became friends. And uh, it was in about, what, was that 2016? It was 2016, uh, where we were both at Sundance, and we happened to be sharing a car, uh, zipping off someplace, and Brad told me about this project that he had been working on. Um, American Reckoning, and I was very intrigued. And uh, when I got home, he'd sent me the materials, and um, I was, you know, taken by the the materials, the footage, the treatment. But I was also especially taken by the fact that the story included the um, the deacons for defense, and I had. Uh, been kind of slightly obsessed with them when I discovered them the few years before. And um, so that even got me even more excited to be a part of this project. Uh, and that was, so we, you know, started um, together in uh, probably in earnest in 2017. I went down to Mississippi with Brad, met um, Denise and, and Warless Jr. And uh, we did some interviews in um, in New York as well. That's where we interviewed Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, And um, we then hooked up, at that point we had hooked up with Retro Report, uh, which was very supportive of the project uh, to be you know, a short that we wanted to turn into a feature. And then uh, we hooked up with Frontline. Uh, Frontline knew about the project, they contacted us and asked if we wanted to be part of their unresolved 
series. Um, and of course we, you know, we said yes. And so we worked with both those partners on the film. And just to wrap all that up, Unresolved encompasses a number of different uh, platforms that are telling stories and raising awareness about these cases, including a uh, podcast series and also a really amazing uh, both web-based and in-person-based um, uh, augmented reality exhibit. So we're happy to be part of all that. Thank you so much. It's, it's really helpful because a lot of the people that uh, come to our festivals are filmmakers themselves. So just hearing about your journey and the different, like when did you get a partner to make the project with and like uh, supporting partners is always really important for people to understand that everything doesn't happen at once from the very beginning. You know, you gotta start working and things get there. So thank you for that. Um, we also have um, Cynthia. Cynthia, you served um, at the FBI as a special agent and chief for about 22 years. You specialize in civil rights programs and were also responsible for the cold case initiative even before the TIL Act uh, passed in 2008. Um, and then you continue working in civil rights. So um, you, uh, your understanding of like how institutions uh, sometimes perpetuate uh, systemic racism is better than most. So as civilians, I have like a strong question for you. Like, what do you think we should be doing to make our institutions more accountable? Well, thank you for that question, Ruth. And I want to thank um, Doc NYC as well and for Brad and Yoruba for their absolutely amazing work and uh, to Warless Jackson's family for just their persistence and determination to continue to tell his story is just remarkable. So thank you. Um, I think the truth. Um, so I think if people, if institutions, agencies, organizations, if they accept the truth of our history, then they can be held accountable for it. If they don't bother to understand what happened in the past, it's not gonna help um, inform their work to combat racism and discrimination and prejudice today. So I think one of the things I learned really from working with cold case investigations and with families and with investigators is this, this notion of intergenerational trauma that, and really it, it speaks to the journey of the, of the Warless Jackson family that you can see how something that was just horrific, something that happened to them in the 1960s in Mississippi um, informed who they became as children and young adults and as older adults and how they matured. And that's very, that trajectory and that journey is very, um, it's very standard among families who have experienced trauma. So I think we have to understand what our history is. I think law enforcement officers have to understand and acknowledge the role they played in our history in the United States with perpetuating racism and racial terror and with lynchings. And if police officers don't understand and appreciate that history, um, it's going to do themselves a disservice when they try to be guardians in their community. So I think how you combat a lot of this is really just to accept our truth and accept our history as to who we are in the United States. Thank you so much. And Denise, thank you so much for joining us today as well and for your amazing um, you know, generosity in the film and sharing your life story with us. Um, we see in the film, that there is some beautiful steps towards honoring your father's work, um, like the historic market that you uh, organized in the street as a Natchez uh, civil rights activist. But the documentary leaves us with a sense that the federal effort to grapple with American you know, racist killings through the Till Act did not produce a lot of actual changes against the perpetrators. Or So do you think, um, what do you think, what kind of reparations do you think we should be working towards politically and socially, if you think um, there can be a better sense of justice um, for all of us? Again, thank you all for allowing me to be here. Um, one thing that I can say, you know, justice is still uh, not being served in today's society even though 50 years ago, you know, people were being uh, killed. I'm gonna use the word killed. And uh, the perpetrators were not being 
held accountable for. And uh, to look at today's society living in the 21st century and to see so much po uh, police brutality still going on, uh, crimes, uh, things are still not being, uh, people are not being held accountable for their actions. It's just, you know, is I don't know, uh, even to, rep to the reparation party, what can we do? You know, counseling need to be helpful. Some of these uh, uh, parents, children, whereas back then, then we didn't have that opportunity to have someone to counsel us or to help us to come through. It was just the grace of my mother being who she was to help us to get through uh, the challenges that we experienced back then. So we need counseling. You know, people talk about mental illness. You know, once they get the opportunity to have these services and someone to really care about them and help them to get to a point to understand what's really happening, uh, how to deal with certain situations. You know, it may help get, you know, be a better society. And it's not about money. It's not about uh, free items or free things. It's about truth and being honest with individuals. And in terms of like, uh, also like the, unfortunately, because these this racist uh, killings keep, keep happening, um, a lot of people suffer through the same things that you suffer through. There's a moment that is really important in the film where your brother, Dennis um, um, Wallace Jackson Jr. is, is uh, giving advice and, and consoling and supporting um, a young person who's, whose uh, family member was also killed, um, sister. sister. And um, I don't see that many spaces in society where those kinds of conversations can happen across the timeline. So, and I know like the, the one of the biggest efforts behind this film was to precisely um, unbury those truths and, and bring up those conversations. Do you wanna to talk to us a little bit about the kind of conversations that the film is generating and allowing and kind of like the, the social connector of, of like knowing these this, uh, historical truths? Uh, well, when we met, uh, thank God for uh, uh, Janice McDonald and Paula Johnson of Syracuse University, who uh, had organized or had a gathering, and we found out that there were so many families that were suffering the way we were suffering, and that unity brought all of us uh, close together. We were able to share with one another uh, well, we the steps that we were doing to try to get through. And I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to move on. My mother used to say all the time that uh, she did not realize my brother had so much trauma and that she uh, kept saying that I'm sorry that I did not get the help, did not try to get him some kind of help because when she realized what kind of trauma that he was going through, she saw that he needed some mental help. And uh, so when he started talking to other families about what it takes for him as as because like I said, we was raised up with a family that taught us how to love one another. You know, we don't see I don't see color of people's skin because we're all of God's children. And because you know she instilled in us and my father instilled of us that you know it's about love. We need to love one another. We need to support one another. And when he offered advice to other families about the struggles that he has gone through and what he could have done to himself you know, behind this, but because of God's grace and goodness, it's a, you know, what's sustaining him is keeping him, you know, to maintain. Sometimes he goes back and, you know, people don't understand him, but when you uh, have been around a person and you understand a person, you know, I have to understand, I know where you're coming from, I know where you've been, and I do experience your pain. All of our pains are different. All of our sufferings are different, but because, again, we was reared up in a family that instill into us godly words, reading the Bible, taking us to church on Sundays, going to Sunday school, understanding what thus said the Lord. These are, these are the things that he can offer others to help them to get through to survive these uh, tragedies that they've experienced. And again, the, the uh, meetings of the gatherings that we've had with other family members, you know, their support helps us to know that we are not alone and we are not suffering alone. And, you know, with us communicating with one another, and I think, and I know he still communicate with uh, several others today. And with them constantly talking, they are encouraging, 
encouraging each other how to be strong and how to move on, you know, and try to see what can we do to uh, help other family members along the way as well. And that's by sharing words of wisdom, you know, and what, what I've experienced and what brought me over to get to this point. Do you want to say anything, Yoruba or Brad, about the uh, kinds of conversations that the film is also allowing you to have? Because you've been traveling with the film quite a bit. Yeah, I'll jump in. I mean, um, I think the other, uh, one of the other themes of the film, I mentioned the Deacons for Defense, uh, really um, understanding the different strategies of the movement of the Black freedom struggle. And, you know, we were able, because of this amazing footage um, and the incredible participation of Denise and, and Warless Jr. to tell the story of, you know, the civil rights fight in Natchez, which I had never, you know, I had never heard of personally. Um, but that also too, there was, besides the strategy of nonviolence, which we, you know, often, which we, you know, almost exclusively hear about, when understanding our um, our civil rights movement, there were other strategies, and uh, self defense was a big part of that strategy, and in fact went hand in hand with nonviolence. Um, and because the deacons for defense, which were you know all through Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, had to you know they protected their community from the terrorism that you know that we see in the in the film. So that has been uh, a, a very um, you know a, a, a theme that we've talked about in showing the film and allows us to understand um, and to see literally visually you know to see that at work. And I think that's really important to understanding our history. Can you talk a little bit also about the um, the incredible footage that you um, found and that it's actually of Warler Senior and like swearing an oath at the Deacons of Defense. So incredible that you were able to tell the story with this incredible, beautiful footage of the time. Um, tell us a little bit more about it and how did you find it and how much love do you have for it? <laughs> Well, I'll talk about the love and then Brad could talk about how you how you found it. I mean, it's I've never worked on a film that had that basically we could tell the story through the footage, the historical footage. I mean, that what a gift. How amazing. Um it was, I mean, it's unbelievable. And the the footage is so beautiful, so well shot. Um, and you know, I think it's it's just such a special, so special to be able to work with that footage. We we had uh, found out that about the footage because we had found out about the film Black Natchez that was made. Um, I don't know exactly when it was released, probably like 1970 or something like that. But the filmmaker Ed Pincus is the one who uh, filmed all of that. And then we sort of followed a path that led to the Amistad Research Center, which had acquired not just the film, but also just tens and tens and tens, maybe like 70 hours of outtakes. And not only that, that's when we discovered once we started working with them that the film crew had gone back to try to do a sequel, which never got made, but they filmed in 1967, precisely because they had found out that um, Denise and Wurlis's dad had been murdered by, um, by this offshoot of the Klan, by the Silver Dollar Group, and they wanted to return to see what was happening. So it was totally incredible. And Amistad was just amazing as a partner to help us. We had to process all this footage. We had to figure out what to do with shrunken sound, um, you know, sound, what do you even call it? Tape, found, uh, film that had to be sunk back to the 16 millimeter footage. So it's a bygone era that come alive. So perhaps like you both can tell us a little bit and maybe Cynthia can chime in as well. Um, talking about how, um, we see you working with local journalists like Stanley Nelson, the editor of the Concordia Sentinel. And these kind of uh, investigative local journalists are disappearing a lot uh, from the media landscape. But, uh, you know, it's really interesting for us, the viewers, to find out that he's actually the one that is that has like a larger ability to really gather information from within the community and that came up with like the answers of like the Silver Dollar Club, Glover, and also maybe 
how did you manage to approach Leland Boyd and Deborah Taylor, you know, the sons and daughters of the clan members that speak in the film? So perhaps like the, the three of you and maybe even uh, Denise, you can jump in here as well, can tell us about this idea of like working with other people outside uh, kind of like the legal or FBI uh, kind of uh, realm. And, and also like having these conversations with the descendants of the perpetrators, which are so important and we barely ever get to hear from. So just whoever you wanna take it. I, I can start quickly. So um, I learned um, when I was really in the throes of the cold case initiative that it, it, it became very clear to me that um, survivors and witnesses were very loath to speak to an FBI agent, whether the FBI agent was from the South, not from the South, older, younger, it didn't matter. If 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 somebody was approached by the FBI, there was a, a, a very real fear and hesitation to talk to us. And that could be because just fear of law enforcement in general, it could be fear of the perpetrators' families that still lived in the neighborhood. It could be it, it could be a variety of things. It could just be, again, that intergenerational trauma of just being afraid of law enforcement. So it became clear that many people just were not going to talk to us. But as I came to know folks like Brad and Yoruba and, and Stanley Nelson and Jerry Mitchell, it it was very clear to me that families were very comfortable speaking to an investigative journalist, um, an academic. I mean, Denise talked about the folks at Syracuse. Um, there's also folks at the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern Law School run by Margaret Burnham. So it became very obvious to me that the truth probably would come out um, through another vehicle that was not law enforcement. And the way I saw that was great. However it came out, it needed to come out. And if someone was more comfortable talking to a journalist than me, okay. Like I just, I needed, I needed the truth to come out to right the wrongs of history and to correct um, oftentimes the injustices that the FBI perpetrated in the South. So I was very comfortable turning things over to journalists um, if they could get at the truth more so than I could. Brad or Yoruba? Um, well, I can jump in uh, quickly. First of all, you're totally right. It's so important to hear from the uh, children of the perpetrators or the descendants of the perpetrators. That's something Yoruba and I were, wanted to make sure that we pursued right from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I have to really um, say that, that Deborah in particular, who um, experienced a very painful childhood uh, with her father, who was one of the leaders of the Silver Dollar Group, um, was very courageous to also travel like Warless through a great deal of trauma to be able to share her story. Um, the other thing is, you know, one of the things we discovered in doing this project is that there were things that um, law enforcement and, um, and the legal apparatus of the federal government knew but could not say publicly because it didn't meet standards of evidence that are guidelines for what they do, which is essentially try to decide whether or not to prepare a grand jury and then take something to trial. Um, and Cynthia is exactly right. I mean, to the extent that any of these cases have been solved and, and really none on the Till Act have, but uh, prior to the Till Act and prior to this effort, um, you know, Jerry Mitchell, who Cynthia just, just uh, mentioned, who works out of Jackson, Mississippi, was able to point law enforcement to um, ev new evidence in the killing of Medgar Evers. And that was successfully brought to trial by, um, by the, well, by the FBI's cooperation and the DOJ's prosecution. Uh, but it's, it's very, very rare. And, you know, in fact, it points to why this movie, but even more than this movie, um, the, the work that's being done to demand the accountability of law enforcement now is so important because we don't want to be here 50 years from now and talk about how we can't find evidence to prosecute these cases. Um, I mean, maybe that's a perfect toss to Yoruba. She made a film about Breonna Taylor, which is precisely what I'm talking about in terms of the here and now. Well, I just wanna say that 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm not on mute. Okay. That um, you mentioned the, you know, the work of local journalists who uh, are fast you know, disappearing because of what's happening to the industry. I mean, Stanley's uh, dogged reporting was so crucial uh, for us in understanding uh, that Warless wasn't the Warless's case, but that there were a series of murders by the Silver Dollar Group uh, during that time. And, uh, and he also connected us to uh, some of those descendants of the perpetrators. And just wanna emphasize um, how important it is to hear their stories and to hear they, their memories and the way in which their, um, you know, the what was told to them. Because um, if we don't do that, we're really not gonna understand our history in this country. Um, because this is an American history. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I just, you know, think that the this work of, this is, I've, I've worked on now a few films that have started with a book um, and the work that goes into the research, the connections um, is so crucial and really a gift to us as documentarians. Denise, you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, the chance to speak in um, to perpetrators and um, how that having that conversation come to light um, is helpful in any way? I, I do want to say that uh, I give hats off to Jerry Mitchell because back in the 60s, he was the one that also tried to help with my father's case. And when the FBI told us that um, they were turning that case over back to the local authorities in Natchez, Jerry along, you know, he started doing his own research. And I do remember him communicating with my mom about my father's case. Can't tell you in depth what was what, but I do know Jerry Mitchell did try to help solve my father's case. Uh, I was very elated to see that um, in this film that there were uh, the perpetrators uh, children able to talk about things that they couldn't talk about because of the fear of what their parents a dad was going to do to them if they said anything. And, you know, uh, when I started working in the school district back in the 70s, you know, the little children would call, you know, others out of their names and things. And I'm like, baby, where did you get this from? Well, my dad and my mom is teaching us this. So I'm saying to, uh, I want to say that uh, I appreciate Yoruba, Brad, Stanley Nelson for the work that they did in helping retell the story of my father. Uh, Stanley Nelson, I can't thank him enough because it took, it's sad that it took a journalist It took a journalist to tell us what the local authorities should have told us and what the FBI failed to do for us. But, um, and I'm just sorry that my mother was not here to see or hear this because her, her desire was to always find out who killed my father? And Stanley Nelson was able to give us the information that we needed. We were, we were waiting to hear. And uh, again, in the film, I was proud to see the uh, these uh, people, children tell what they experienced growing up in their homes. And they were not afraid, even though they are older now, they can talk about it. And so hopefully down, you know, in the future that, you know, no more doors will be closed and people will start talking and letting, you know, someone know what's actually happening and that families can be able to rectify or be able to live in peace now and without uh, hoping that something would happen to them. And again, like I said, uh, the Deacons of Defense, you know, we talked to Rich uh, Dip Lewis and the information that he shared and how they protected, you know, my father and uh, uh, James Stokes and all these people back in the days, it it, 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 was, it has been truly instrumental and very fruitful to know what happened and how things, you know, transpired. So that's all. And I'm sorry about the tears, but it is what it is. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Denise. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I got the five minute warning sign a while ago, but perhaps we can finish by maybe all of you telling us some of those uh, conversations that you're facilitating uh, with this film uh, in terms of like the outreach campaign and the things that we can look forward to. Um, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit of um, what does what the film allow you to do to bring this conversation to light and to share, shed light in these truths and um, maybe how is the project gonna continue moving forward? Well, I'll just say that, you know, as a filmmaker who has done a few historical films, it's for me, it's really about um, uncovering the truth of this country and of the experiences of my people who have um, suffered uh, you know, and 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 have been victims of and survived, um, and how that how that uh, what that means for today. And we talked a little bit about the about that, and what it means in terms of accountability. So I think it allows us to have all those conversations, um, and we're also really excited because we're going to have a screening on December seventh at. Uh, DCTV, Downtown Community Television. I'm sorry, June, June. 7th, <laughs> June. Um, and uh, we'll we'll have a panel and we'll continue, you know, this conversation. I'll just add quickly, um, you know, one one of the most important things that we're doing with the film is getting it out to educators. You know, as Yoruba pointed out, um, th this is a part of American history uh, that, especially these days, when there are efforts out there to ban books. It's really important that we make sure that all of American history is included in what children learn. Um, and so Retro Report especially has been very helpful and frontline of course to the PBS system in getting this film out to, um, to those folks. And then also um, just the other day, I was at Syracuse Law School with um, Dr. Paula Johnson, who we just mentioned. And that's really about educating the next generation because if we're gonna hold a, accountable these institutions, we have to train the future lawyers of the world um, about how to do that and why it's so important, which is another thing that we're doing with the film. Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you all. I'm so sorry this is all the time we have today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you, Ruth. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody watching at home.